Today's episode is brought to you by DeSanto Propane. DeSanto Propane is four generations strong as a trustworthy family-owned business with unmatched customer service. Go online at DeSantoPropane.com for more info or call toll-free at 1-800-752-4574. Since 1937, the difference has been DeSanto Propane. Today we continue our series previewing local elections across the Finger Lakes by catching up with one of the candidates running for Auburn City Council. Brian Dahl joins me via Zoom. Brian, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thank you for the invite. Uh, So let's start with the easy question first. Why are you running for City Council? Well, I asked myself that question many, many times. However, in 2017, I became very ill and I was nearly on my deathbed. Well, one of the Um, issues that I had is they had a bacteria in my blood system that evidently they couldn't cure, they couldn't figure out the cure and I ended up having to have a liver transplant. And during that process, they identified the bacteria, but lo and behold, the city of Auburn sent out a uh, pamphlet uh, a year and a half ago regarding our city water. Well, the bacteria that they had in the city water is exactly was the organism that nearly killed me. Uh, well, I guess the, the obvious follow up to that is uh, how that play out. Uh, you're here, obviously, talking with us, so it must I'm have been somewhat involved, positive. And thank you for the don- donors that uh, are very involved in Donate for Life. Um, I am a huge advocate for Donate for Life, and it just so happened that um, I ended up receiving two gifts of life. Incredible stuff. Uh, Obviously, we're going to get into some of the environmental and infrastructure issues that the city faces. Uh, But first, I want to ask you, what are the biggest issues that you're hearing from constituents as you uh, tour the city uh, and talk to different folks uh, living there? What are the biggest issues you're hearing from them? A lot of the, the things that I'm hearing is the population. We're losing population across the city, across the county, actually across the state. So it's not just domain to the city of Auburn. The problem with the city of Auburn is we are losing regular homeowners. When homeowners are up in age, they 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 pass or what have you, they're turning people are buying the houses up and turning them into apartments. And then there's no regulation with the apartments um, with code enforcement. I remember years ago when I first got my apartment, code enforcement came in and did an inspection. Um, six months into my into my stay, they came in, did a routine inspection. All was well. The place was clean. The place was picked up. I don't think that's happening because my son's been in an apartment now for three years and he has yet to have anybody come in and do an inspection of the property. So our properties are failing. They're deteriorating. And where you have failed properties, you have crime. Yeah. Um, you mentioned population decline, so we'll go there next. Uh, projections forecast a 40% increase in seniors living in the Finger Lakes by 2040, while other, all other age groups under 65 are expected to decline between 7 and 14%. When you think about a city like Auburn, uh, what is the greatest operational concern there, probably in tax base, but also what do you think the city can do to help reverse that trend? Well, Economic uh, development is is one of the keywords. However, there's not much brown space left to invite agriculture, not agriculture, but uh, we of course we have the milk plant, and we need to actually help them broaden their horizons at the milk plant and see what we can do to offer some other assistance inside the city of Auburn. Maybe use utilizing the milk plant as the the old bombardier place and see if we can't. I mean, they're putting on a, a doubling the size of the milk plant now. Um, you know, they're putting water in, sewer in, a huge new building um, that could have been part of the city of Auburn right there on Columbus Street. I mean, it's zoned for it. Uh, the building's been sitting vacant for uh, I don't know how many years, as long as I can remember. Um, but we need tax. We need to start collecting tax from businesses. And we keep, you hear it across the state, oh, we're going to give them a tax break. Well, that tax break falls back onto the consumers, which is the people that own these homes. Yeah. Um, 
you mentioned economic development and the city is kind of in a challenging space right now because there aren't a ton of developable uh, developable sites. Sure. Uh, when someone says to you, Auburn needs more economic development, when you think about that vision of what successful economic development could look like in the next, say, five to seven years, obviously Micron probably comes to mind. I wonder what your take is there and how much of an impact Micron can have uh, in Auburn. And then also, what do you think successful economic development in general looks like in the city of Auburn? Well, everybody's talking about Micron all across the state. Everybody's talking about it. There was just a big thing on the news that they're going to broaden their horizons out in Buffalo and Rochester and Utica. Hitting Auburn, they're five years out before they're even shovel ready. So that's five years out just for the planning and all that. Before they put a shovel in, it's going to take at least a year. So that's we're talking 10 years before they broaden their horizons into the city of Auburn. We need to fix it now. We need tax base now. That's fine. We can plan on um, them coming in. We're looking at putting water um, and throughout the county and some of the dead spots that don't have water and they're running off wells. And the water's not drinkable. Um, but getting some of our sites, we're holding on to sites, which I don't know why. We need to open those sites for business. Does part of that, when you're talking about uh, shorter term economic development, does that mean that perhaps the city look at uh, making it easier for uh, micro businesses, small businesses to be able to get off the ground more quickly? Absolutely. Um, you know, you look around the city and you, every block you go to, you find a smoke shop or you find a pizza shop or a bar. Yeah, they're great for the for the constituents that drink. I don't drink personally because that's just not something that I do. Um, bars are great. They're a great place to go and relax. But there's other things that we could be doing to draw in. How about some theater? How about some, you know, the movie theaters are falling apart around here. Um, nobody's doing that. We have to think outside the box. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the environment, there's a lot of concern about the long term health of Owasco Lake. That's very personal for you, I'm sure. Um, if elected, how would you like to see the city uh, approach this issue? Obviously, it's a it's an ongoing thing where the city has been uh, dealing with some of the side effects of Wasco Lake's current situation. But what would you like to see the next phase of that look like? Well, the next phase is, you know, it's a little too late. Um, the mayor put out a letter to the governor requesting funds um, or we're going to become the next Flint, Michigan um, with the water source. Um, that's pretty scary. The public has no idea what's going on with our water source. They put out that publication a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago, and we've heard nothing since. If people were to go online and look at the water quality of our lake, you can see the drastic rise in the pollution and, and the phosphorus and the other, uh, what do they call them? Uh, I got it here on my note, Hy trihydromethane that's in our water system. Um, I, I don't know if you're drinking water right now, but uh, you probably should not drink the city water. Yeah. I'm not um, trying to scare anybody, but anybody with autoimmune disease, don't drink city water. When you know, you're like sure, um, obviously, water is one layer of uh, what people consider to be infrastructure. There are many other components to that. Uh, when you think about the city's infrastructure needs over the next five to 10 years, especially in relation to economic development and getting more uh, business in this city. What stands out to you as priorities beyond water? Well, water is the, the biggest thing that we all need. Everybody has to have water, but we also need to have fossil fuels. I know the governor is trying to get rid of the fossil fuels in uh, New York state. So fossil fuels, sewer, um, whatever else we need to supply. Um, Natural gas is huge. Yeah. And one of our largest supplier of electricity is Nucor. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. They see their light bulbs flashing and they have no idea why their light bulbs are flashing. Hello, that is the largest supplier of electric in, um, electric electricity in Cayuga County would be Nucor Steel. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about first responders. Uh, obviously, EMS service made headlines over the last week in the Auburn area. Uh, generally speaking, the struggles on that front, though, they, they aren't unusual for Auburn or Cayuga County. How would you like to see the city approach uh, EMS service moving forward? Well, everybody's attacking the city of Auburn regarding the ambulance service. The ambulance service in Auburn is doing just fine. However, the system is crazy right now um, between the hospitals, the state, 
um, our local EMS, our volunteers. Um, I bleed, bleed red, right, and blue um, when it comes to fire and EMS and police police offices. Um, I've done it. I was the emergency manager for Cuga County for 15 years, worked with Homeland Security, worked with all the police on major events. Um, you know, I'm a volunteer fireman, fire chief out in the troop fire department. I've been a, a critical care tech medic on the ambulance for over 30 years. And so when it comes to fire and EMS, there's there's a, a state process that takes the city of Auburn owns a municipal CON through the Auburn Fire Department. They can't reach out into the county um, with another certificate of need. So they cannot gain access to the county. So that means another system has got to come in or right now the volunteers have to pick up that pace and rely on the city of Auburn to come mutual aid uh, wherever they can. Um, I feel sorry for the folks like Conquest. I'll use Conquest as an example. They're at least 40 minutes out in some places that rely on Auburn or um, AMR, ambulance services. Whether the city goes to that, that's 40, 45 to 50 minutes to some of the response times. When you got somebody down on the ground and CPR is in progress, time is brain, time is going to be death if we have to wait 45 minutes. That scares me. I was going to say, given your your experience, um, 15 years in emergency management, obviously with the the fire department on the volunteer basis, when you when you think about how uh, fire and EMS response has changed over the last 30 years in a place like uh, Cuga County in Auburn, uh, what stands out to you as some of the the bigger things that have maybe trended in the wrong direction? Some of the things that are going in the wrong direction is years ago, we put out a, um, everybody's putting out things, only call 911 when you have an emergency. Uh, 911 receives so many phone calls for non-emergency stuff and we're getting dispatched to it. So we're tying up an ambulance for somebody with a toothache that could certainly get into a taxi or uh, hop a bus or take their own car to the hospital instead of calling an ambulance. They think an ambulance is going to get them in to see the doctor faster, which it's not because basically they're going to get triaged and they're going to get sent to the waiting room and they're going to sit at the bottom of the pile and wait just like everybody else's. So an ambulance service is sometimes not always the fastest. Yeah. Um, we need to go to a priority dispatch. Um, priority dispatching is uh, setting up as the, not just because you're the first call, but you get sent. The second call may be critical and they we, they get sent first. Um, so right now, uh, is the whole system is broke. The whole system, not just in the city of Auburn. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about police service in the city. Obviously, we hear a lot about the recruiting struggles that law enforcement agencies across the region are facing. Uh, from a public safety standpoint, what would you like to see the city prioritize moving forward to maybe uh, aid in the recruiting side of things so that the police force is able to stay at uh, at its top uh, uh, fulfillment? Well, I'm not sure how the city hiring practices, I, I can tell you how it was with the county. Um, they had to wait for somebody to leave in order to fill that position. I would like to change that. So if somebody, if say uh, uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy's going to retire tomorrow and then all of a sudden now we got to fill that position. If we knew that six months ago, then we can get a recruit class in, in place and um, get these people in the training class. So when they do retire, we have somebody that can go on the, on, on the road with an FTO and get these people trained while that person is in the process of retiring. Uh, yeah. Right now, we're waiting till people leave, and then we're struggling to trying to find a recruit class to get people sit it, get, getting into that class. Same things happen across the board. The, you know, DPW, same thing. It, you know, it's just, it's crazy the way we do things around here. Um, we need to be a little more proactive than reactive. Do you think uh, it, it seems to be as frequently framed as a tax question, um, but do you think maintaining the the actual manpower forces that make up city services will be the biggest challenge over the next decade for a city like Auburn? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the Auburn Fire has got it worked out. You need to have at least 15 people on, on, a, on a crew, on a ship. Um, and a lot of times the backfill, when they, there is a major structure fire, bringing people in off the off their off ship um, to be able to maintain other vehicles to keep the city running, um, that's 
you just have to. You just have to do that. That's just good thinking. I would like to see that with the police department. The sheriff's department has um, take-home cars. Those take-home cars can be on the ready at any minute. Why isn't the city of Auburn doing that? You know, our peak times, uh, Friday night, when there's bar fights all over the place and there's people chasing drug dealers. And, you know, it's just we need to have the extra police officers at the moment's notice and instead of, you know, the priority one call for a domestic going on that gets unattended to for half an hour because they're dealing with a bar fight. You know, I'm not sure that that's happening, but I would like to see more officers called in off shift uh, when it's, the time is needed. Let's talk a little bit about housing. Uh, you mentioned it earlier in the interview here, whether we're talking about single family development, skyrocketing rental prices, overpopulation of Airbnb properties, or just lack of senior housing. These are all issues that communities across the region are facing. What do you think the city can do to move the needle in a positive direction on the housing front? Well, years ago, uh, my grandmother was at Stryker Homes. Um, she loved it there because it was quiet. It was just the elderly population. Now, as an EMS provider, when we are going into the city of Auburn, you go to Stryker or you go to Swartz Towers, there's just about anybody and everybody living there. It could be a crack dealer living next door. It can be, you know, it's it's just crazy. It's just the housing development across the city of Auburn, across the county, across the state is is crazy. And I don't know how to fix that right now, but we need proprietary homes for the elderly only. Um, the other housing is maybe using some of these other brownfields for housing, um, for rental properties. Um, the perfect place for that would be down on the old uh, Dunham McCarthy building. You know, use that property, put up a high rise um, for, for people that do not have apartments. The biggest issue that I'm seeing is we have vagrants that are living in the woods behind several of the stores. I mean, they're all over the place and they have no place to go. Um, it's either they don't want to go someplace or they're happy where they are um, or they're just shunned. They're pushed out into the neighborhood and you're seeing a lot of theft around those camps. Yeah. Um, most common question we get from readers uh, has to do with taxes when it comes to keeping taxes as low as possible. What do you think the keys are to keeping taxes low and how do you respond to that question when somebody inevitably asks you, uh, are you going to keep my taxes low if elected? <laughs> It's, it's funny. Uh, people, all, everybody wants taxes low. However, our inflation rates keep going up. So when inflation goes up, cost of products keep going up. So I, I don't think there's ever an answer. Everybody thinks there's a magic wand that's going to lower my taxes. Um, but budgets, people have budgets. Uh, when I worked for the county, it, it was funny because you would see the UPS trucks around this time of the year till the end of the budget season. Um, it was the staples and it was, you know, it was like Christmas, you know, all of a sudden, oh, we got to buy paper. Oh, we got to buy all this. Uh, th that needs to stop. You got to plan at the beginning of the year when the budgets come through, start getting your stuff as you need it. If you don't need it this year, get it next year, but start cutting some of these budgets that, you know, have a lot of fluff in them. And I know there's a lot of fluff. One criticism we've heard pretty regularly from candidates across the region uh, is that perhaps the budget process in some communities is a bit too short and that perhaps it should be a longer process, one that is happening uh, more over the entire year, uh, analysis month by month, rather than budget season being a couple months in the fall when you only have one or two decision cycles for most uh, government entities. Is that kind of what you're, you're thinking about here too as well? Well, it's funny you say that. A lot of people start their budgets and uh, maybe the city start, theirs comes out in Jul uh, July. They'll start in like April, May. I'm a guy that likes to see the budgets after the budget has been passed for next year. So if I get elected, then I, you know, I'm going to be coming and looking. Why do we really need the extra $10,000 in a budget line that you haven't touched in the last four years? Um, emergency management is different because you never know when there's an emergency coming up. There's always a general fund that you can go and ask the county uh, account or the city council people, hey, I really need this and it's going to cost us much. They can pull it from there. I would much rather people do that than just spend it or hang on to it and hoard it. And lastly, your uh, your final pitch here to voters. We're a couple weeks away from Election Day. Why should voters choose you? 
Well, I'm not your typical Republican or conservative. Um, as an EMS provider, I treat every person the same, whether you're whatever your race, color, or creed are. Um, to me, that nothing bothers me. Um, it's water off my back. If you got a problem, I, my my door is always open. Uh, my phone is always on. I'll take anybody's question 24 hours a day, within reason during the middle of the night, because <laughs> the pager goes off, and then I, I get up and then I go. Um, but I think electing me, I come with an emergency management background to help deal with the fire EMS and the police um, and DPW. I work closely with the DPW um, throughout my career. Um, I, I come with, um, I deal with grants all the time. I, you know, in the emergency management office, I was bringing in millions of dollars of grants, um, not just one or two, multiple grants. And I, I actually have the contacts for a lot of people and a lot of different grants that, you know, yes, grants are taxpayers' money, but if they're used wisely, wisely, and it's not going to cost us a lot more in the background, um, that's those are the grants we want to target. We really need some grants right now to help our water quality, and I know where to go and get those. Um, and. I need to bring everyone together. Everybody's got to work together, whether they're in the Republican Party or the Conservative Party or the Democratic Party. Um, I have the ability to bring all of those cohesively together. Brian, appreciate the time. Thanks so much for taking it today. Thank you so much, Josh. I appreciate it. That'll do it for this edition of FLX Today. If you'd like to hear more conversations like this one, check out the show on your favorite podcast platform or subscribe to the FingerLakesOne.com YouTube channel. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.